From Rutgers University, Newark, this is Aging and Alzheimer's Disease. Today's lecture will have two sections. The first part, the shorter part, will discuss normal aging, the behavioral and brain changes, and that will set the context for talking about Alzheimer's disease and the various aspects of Alzheimer's disease that are important to understand in the context of being compared to what happens in normal aging. We'll start by talking about the behavioral changes that happened across the lifespan as we age. There are a diverse set of biological processes that, with the passage of time, alter the anatomy, the neurochemistry, and the physiology of all organisms. In the Seattle Longitudinal Study, they tested over 6,000 individuals and found relatively little change in most kinds of cognitive ability, including verbal memory, as participants age from their 20s to their 50s. However, many cognitive abilities start to decline as humans reach their 60s and beyond. Some forms of memory, such as working memory, start to decline in humans as young as the mid-30s. Others, such as semantic knowledge and verbal ability, tend to remain strong well into old age. This graph here shows from about 25 up to late 80s the, uh, the, sort of the average uh, abilities of uh, a variety of cognitive functions. And you can see that up till about 60, there's relatively little change. And then there starts to be a precipitous decline down um, in a whole variety of different functions. Let's talk about working memory. This is one of the last memory systems to fully mature in humans and other animals. Not till the late teens or early 20s do we see working memory um, at its peak. But it's also one of the first to show deficits in the course of healthy aging. One theory suggests that this is because older adults are more susceptible to proactive interference than our younger people. Namely, that is the ability of older inter information to interfere with new learning. Possibly, older adults are less able to inhibit irrelevant older information from entering working memory, where it crowds out the information that is relevant now. In contrast, learning by conditioning, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, um, declines with age, um, and skill learning also declines in old age. However, though the learning of new associations and skills is slowed in healthy aging, highly practiced skills tend to be maintained well. Let's talk about episodic memory and semantic memory. Old memories fare better than new learning. Existing episodic and semantic memories tend to survive very well into extreme old age. Although well-formed memories may survive, elderly adults are generally less effective at forming new semantic episodic memories. This deficit in elderly adults appears to be due to encoding difficulties rather than retrieval difficulties, and this is why it's the new memories that are harder for older people to lay down. Emotion may also affect memory differently as we age, and some studies have suggested that older adults are more likely to remember positive information. We see that in this study here of emotion and episodic memory across the lifespan, showing that older adults have a positive memory bias. Here are images, there are positive images, negative images, and neutral images. And what we see is that uh, across both groups, neutral images are uh, recalled the least. Um, so that images that have a high valence, a positive, you know, a good Im image or a, or a scary or negative image um, are recurred better. But we see in young adults, positive and negative images are recalled about the same. But as people get older, they begin to show a deficit in negative images. So it's the positive images that are most salient in their recall. If you've ever had that tip of the tongue phenomena where you, you, you think you know, you know you know something, but you can't remember what it is, these kinds of TOT, tip of tongue events, are among the most frequently reported and frustrating memory problems of healthy adults from 64 to 75. The defining feature of tip of the tongue is the strong feeling of knowing, which is in turn a feature of metamemory, metamemory being our ability to reflect and know about our own memory. This age-related decline in acquiring new memory appears to be accompanied by an age-related decline in the ability to accurately assess what we know. Assess what we know. So let's stop here and take a, an interim summary of some of the behavioral changes that happen with aging. The first is that aging is a diverse set of biological processes that alter anatomy, neurochemistry, and physiology. Working memory declines the earliest, perhaps due to proactive interference. Semantic knowledge and verbal ability remain strong throughout the lifespan. Uh, 
and conditioning and skill learning decline slowly. For episodic and semantic memories, difficulties are limited primarily to encoding of new memories, not the retrieval of old memories. And older adults have a positive bias for memory retention. They tend to be more likely to, rec- to uh, retain positive information, good, good news rather than bad news. And finally, there are also declines in metamemory, our ability to know what we know. This sets us up now to take a look at what's happening in the brain during normal aging. We see here a graph of some of the changes that take place in aging, and the the biggest change we see is on the left in the ventricles in the brain, Um, and the other biggest changes are in the areas on the right. You see the HC is the hippocampal complex, the EC is the anterior cortex, so these are the structures in the medial temporal lobe. So it's the cerebral ventricles and the medial temporal lobe where we see the biggest percentage of change um, in brain regions. There's In some areas of the mammalian brain, neurons begin to die off during the normal course of aging. Older adults tend to have smaller volume in the lateral prefrontal cortex, that is the sides of the very front of the brain, but this is not true for all cortical regions. For example, the volume of the primary visual cortex appears to decline very little with age. The hippocampus may shrink in overall volume, but does not appear to show many age-related neuron loss in humans. There may also be age-related decreases in the connectivity between existing neurons. Let's take a closer look now at aging in the prefrontal cortex. So there are four graphs here. Let's look at the top ones first. Volumes in several areas of the prefrontal cortex typically declines with age. That's shown in the left. So between 20 and 80, you see the, uh, the volume in the prefrontal cortex is declining. But other cortical areas, such as the primary visual cortex, do not typically show volume reductions in the course of healthy aging. That's the top right, where we see very little change across the lifespan. So what's happening at the cellular level? Well, for that, we need to go to primate data. And uh, what we see below is a representative prefrontal neuron from a young monkey. That's the bottom left. The inset shows a close-up of a segment of the dendrite from this neuron. It's covered in spines, which are the tiny protrusions from where synapses can form. So these spines are critical for connectivity among neurons. In contrast, in the aged brain, um, you see the number of spines is greatly reduced. If you step back, the neurons don't look that different. But if you look up real close, you see that the spines are greatly reduced, suggesting that even if the neuron is intact, it's probably impaired at making connections with other neurons. So although the total number of hippocampal neurons and synapses does not decline appreciably with aging, there are changes in neuronal function, including a reduced ability to maintain changes in synaptic strength. So it suggests that the changes that occur may be short-term, and they're not uh, encoded in long-term changes. So neuronal plasticity, including long-term potentiation, becomes less stable, meaning that new learning can occur, but it doesn't survive that long. What about new neurons? Um, neurogenesis, the creation of new neurons. Adult neurogenesis continues throughout the lifespan in birds and in rodents, but the adult of uh, the extent of adult neurogenesis in humans is currently unclear. What we see at the right um, from Rusty Gage is uh, a hippocampal complex showing evidence of neurogenesis. So let's briefly summarize the uh, the brain changes that happen with normal energy, uh, normal aging. So cerebral ventricles and the hippocampal region or the medial temporal lobe structures show the most age-related changes across the lifespan, particularly in the later years. Age-related decreases in volume and connectivity occurs between neurons. The prefrontal cortex in particular shows very high levels of loss in both volume and spine density, which is critical for connectivity, but other cortical regions show much less change. Neuroplasticity, the ability to form changes in in neural function, and key for learning, become less stable and less likely to become long-term. They may happen, but then they dissipate quickly. We do not know, however, how neurogenesis, the creation of new neurons, is affecting aging in humans because it's much harder to study. This sets us up now to look from the context of normal aging to ask, What's happening differently in Alzheimer's disease? Many people, as they get older, may notice changes in memory and thinking abilities. At first, these changes may be so subtle that they're easy to explain away as normal aging. And they may be. However, 
It's also possible that they're the earliest symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease, or AD, is the most common form of dementia and accounts for 60% to 80% of all cases of dementia. In the United States alone, it is thought that one person develops AD every 66 seconds on average. In the early stages, people with AD may notice everyday tasks becoming more difficult to perform than before. Some typical early symptoms of AD you may notice include facing increased problems with memory, struggling to find the right words for things, becoming confused about time or place, having trouble managing money or paying bills, experiencing changes in mood, personality or judgment, misplacing or being unable to find things. The symptoms of AD arise because of slow, ongoing injury to different parts of the brain. To begin with some definitions, dementia is a progressive cognitive decline, usually due to accumulating brain pathology. So dementia describes the cognitive loss, the inability to function independently um, and at normal cognitive levels. There are a number of things that can cause dementia, advanced Parkinson's disease, AIDS, uh, even uh, being tremendously dehydrated can all cause dementia. But the most common form of dementia, the most common cause of dementia is probably the best way to put it, is Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's is a form of dementia due to accumulating brain pathology, specifically amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, which we'll discuss in a minute. It affects about 5.5 million people in the United States alone. It seems to affect women more than men, and currently there is no cure. There's a progressive memory loss and cognitive deterioration in Alzheimer's disease. For many, the earliest symptoms of Alzheimer's disease are episodic memory disruptions for new memories, but not the older, already consolidated memories. Spatial navigation declines as well, and notably both depend on the hippocampus and medial temporal lobe. As the disease progresses, patients show marked declines in semantic memory. And among the memory processes that survive the longest in Alzheimer's patients are conditioning and skill memory. Later on in Alzheimer's, we see deficits in language, spatial navigation, reasoning, but old habits and skills remain until very late in life. And there can also be personality changes that maybe reflect other types of underlying changes, including especially prefrontal uh, cortex deficits. So in summary, the behavioral symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease are as follows. The earliest symptoms are a loss of the ability to encode new memories and the loss of spatial navigation. That's why older people with dementia often get lost. Beha these are both behaviors that are known to depend on the hippocampus and the other structures in the medial temporal lobe. Later stages involve a broader range of cognitive ability. And finally, personality changes can occur. And this all occurs over a progressive decline, and it gets worse and worse over time. We now ask, what are the cellular pathology that underlies these behavioral symptoms that are getting worse and worse? Plaques are insoluble deposits of a peptide called amyloid beta, or A-beta. They're formed when a protein called amyloid precursor protein is sequentially cleaved by two enzymes, beta and gamma secretase. Other molecules are generated by this cleavage and may play a role in the disease, but A-beta is the main culprit. A-beta tends to misfold and become sticky, eventually clumping together to form soluble oligomers. Some of these aggregate into large insoluble fibrils that deposit in the brain as plaques. The oligomers come in several forms or species, we don't know exactly which species are toxic, but research shows that they weaken communication and plasticity at synapses. This could be what stops the brain from forming or retrieving memories. Neurons aren't the only cells affected in Alzheimer's disease. Astrocytes and microglia also play a role. Microglia are immune cells that clear out waste and prune synapses during development. Microglia take up a beta, but they also get activated by it, triggering the release of inflammatory cytokines that can damage neurons. The microglia also start to remove synapses by phagocytosis. As synapses start to malfunction and neurons die, abnormal patterns of activity emerge, and eventually 
the brain can't process and store information properly. Another key feature of Alzheimer's disease is neurodegeneration. Neuronal death and damage is triggered by A-beta, but some of A-beta's effects seem to be mediated by another protein seen in the brains of patients, tau, a component of tangles. In a healthy neuron, molecules are carried along the axon on a series of tracks, made of microtubules and stabilized by tau. But in Alzheimer's disease, tau is modified, causing it to dissociate from the microtubules, adopt an abnormal shape, and move from the axon to the cell body. Like A-beta, tau comes in a variety of forms, and we don't know which ones contribute to the disease. And like A-beta, these forms either remain soluble or stick together and deposit as the tangles that Dr. Alzheimer saw. Eventually, these processes kill the neuron. Another problem seen in animal models is that misfolded tau proteins can spread across synapses into healthy neurons. There, they make healthy tau proteins start to misfold as well, spreading pathology across the brain. The pattern of spreading through the different brain regions matches the changing symptoms from early to late stages of Alzheimer's disease. This pattern also reflects how certain neurons are more vulnerable than others to dying. Despite these advances in our understanding of Alzheimer's disease, no cure exists. Well, as noted, plaques and tangles in the brain are the signature neuropathology associated with Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is really defined not by its behavioral symptoms, because many different forms of dementia, causes for dementia, can cause similar behavioral symptoms, but rather by the presence of two kinds of pathology in the brain, amyloid plaques, and neurofibrillary tangles. Amyloid plaques are a deposit of beta amyloid protein, and neurofibrillary tangles are an aggregation of the collapsed remains of the tau proteins that normally hold a neuron in place and help transport nutrients around the cell. So the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease look like this. On the left, we see amyloid plaques. On the right, the neurofibrillary tangles. As plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain, Synapse loss and neuron death occur on a large scale. The amyloid plaques tend to be fairly evenly distributed throughout the cerebral cortex, and the hippocampus is relatively spared at least early in the progression of Alzheimer's. In contrast, neurofibrillary tangles accumulate first in the hippocampus and the nearby areas. What's happening early in Alzheimer's disease? Well, structural fMRI images shown in the top on the left from the brains of two 75-year-olds, one a healthy control is shown on the left and one a patient with Alzheimer's disease on the right. Um, if you look carefully, you can see that the hippocampus in both hemispheres is noticeably smaller in the person on the right with Alzheimer's disease. And so as a result of the smaller hippocampus, you see an enlargement of the ventricles. The bottom graphs show PET images. These are false color diagrams that show the amount of binding that occurs to an agent that associates with beta amyloid. And you can see that the areas with high levels of amyloid appear on the right um, as a yellow and orange, on the low level as green and blue. So the individual on the left shows little or no evidence of amyloid, whereas the individual on the right shows evidence of amyloid that may indicate a pre-symptomatic stage of Alzheimer's disease. So overall, there's a temporal evolution of the various Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. Um, and uh, they're shown here um, in this graph, suggesting that initially there's the, the beta amyloid that's shown in the red. Um, CSF is the cerebral spinal fluid measures of tau in blue. Then the, the yellow is both MRI and FDG of PET, showing the beginnings of some of the changes. Um, in the brain, the shrinkage of, of uh, some of the brain structures and the connectivity changes. And finally, we see the cognitive impairment. So the cognitive impairments are really the latest stage um, of what occurs after all of this neuropathology is growing. So by analogy, we can think of the time course of Alzheimer's disease as being similar to the time course of termite infestation. So there's a preclinical or prodromal stage, which may take 15 to 20 years, and this is like when the termites are beginning to crawl around in the rafters and the beams, and you can't see them and you can't hear them, but they're beginning to eat away at the wood. Then we have a phase called MCI, which lasts for three to five years, mild cognitive impairment. 
And that's when the, the termites are eating away at these, these beams, and you're starting to hear the creaking, and things are beginning to, to, to twist a little bit, and the floor is beginning to sag. You're, you're still functional house, but there's something going on. You're not quite sure what it is. Finally, at the very last stage, we have Alzheimer's disease, which might take, depending on someone's age, last for about five years. And here we begin to see the very foundations of the house in termites collapsing. And it's absolutely clear that we no longer have a functioning brain or, in the, in the image below, a functioning house. So the bottom line here is that by the time someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, literally 80% of the brain damage has already occurred, much like when by the time that the house has collapsed, uh, begins to collapse, 80% of the damage from the termites has already been taking place. Now, the analogy with, with between Alzheimer's and termites is important because if you think about termite powder or something that prevents termites, if you come in at the time that the house has collapsed and start to throw the termite powder all around the house and say, house, be normal again, it's pretty clear that termite powder isn't going to do anything by the time that a house has collapsed. Really, what you need to do is you need to be putting the termite powder at the very beginning as a, as a vaccine, as a preventative, at the very earliest stages where you might begin to see uh, termites starting to damage the, uh, the foundations and the beams of, the, of a house. And the same thing is true with Alzheimer's disease. It's become increasingly clear that interventions at the time someone is already diagnosed with Alzheimer's is probably too late because like a house, much of the structure has already collapsed. Rather, what needs to be done is to develop interventions that happen much earlier, 10 or 15 or sometimes even 20 years earlier, before the damage takes place. So let's summarize what we know about the cellular pathology of Alzheimer's disease. First, we have amyloid plaques. These arise early and are generally evenly distributed throughout the cerebral cortex, but less so in the hippocampus. We have neurofibrillary tangles. These arise later, especially in the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe. Structural MRI and amyloid and tau PET imaging shows a progression that gets worse and worse. There's a temporal evolution as damage becomes more widespread. And it's important to note that most brain damage, perhaps 80% of the brain damage, occurs during a preclinical, or as it, as it is also called, prodromal phase of Alzheimer's disease. Who is most at risk? Let's talk next about the genetic risk factors associated with Alzheimer's disease. Most progress has been made in understanding the genetic basis of a rare early onset form of Alzheimer's disease. So most people get a sort of standard late onset Alzheimer's disease that occurs in the, uh, usually in the 70s or 80s. But a small percent of people will develop Alzheimer's disease very early, uh, often in their 50s or 60s. And that early Alzheimer's disease is almost always due to a genetic influence um, and a gene which, for those people, will cause Alzheimer's almost certainly if they get the gene. But for the rest of the people who get Alzheimer's, the 98% the of the people who have the late onset Alzheimer's disease, there are a number of genes that can increase your risk, but don't absolutely cause it. Um, in particular, genes that function to regulate the lipid metabolism and encode a protein that physically interacts with the alpha, beta, and tau, these can substantially increase risk of Alzheimer's. One is APOE, and there's a, a APOE4 allele that's associated with two to three times the risk of Alzheimer's in heterozygotes if you have just one, and 12 times the risk if you have two of these uh, E4 alleles. Uh, another gene, ABCA7, is specific to those of African ancestry, um, and in African Americans, it's, it has as big a, uh, an impact on in risk as uh, APOE does. What are the pathogenic mechanisms of APOE? APOE is the most well-studied and the most pervasive genetic risk factor. The major risk of APOE on AD pathogenesis is via its effect on amyloid aggregation and clearance. So it influences both the onset of amyloid deposition and the ability of the brain to clear amyloid from the brain. Other mechanisms, including the effect of APOE on synaptic function, neurotoxicity, and so on and so forth, may also contribute to disease processes. So it suggests that APOE may have multiple ways in which it's influencing the development of, uh, of amyloid and therefore the effects of uh, Alzheimer's on the brain. We know less about ABCA7 because it's more poorly studied. It's mostly found in African Americans, although there are animal models of it that have been used to understand some of the underlying neuroscience. 
ABCA7 dysregulation may influence properties of brain cell types, in particular neurons and microglia, by, by disturbing the homeostasis between these lipids that are involved between the, the, the neurons and the microglia. There are alterations in brain cells that are likely to facilitate amyloid precursor protein processing um, and suppress amyloid clearance contributing to AD development. And during the disease progression, ABCA7 deficiency may also exacerbate the neuronal damages and diminish the ability of the microglia to protect the brain. So let's summarize here about genetic risk factors. There are some rare genes um, which cause with 100% likelihood, or penetrance as the term is called, an early onset familial form of AD, but this is very rare and only accounts for a small percent of the people who get Alzheimer's disease. Most Alzheimer's disease is late onset, and it's affected by several genes that increase risk to varying degrees. APOE is the most commonly studied and widely impacted. ABCA7 is another important gene, and it's primarily found in those of African ancestry. Let's talk now about the medial temporal lobe. We've mentioned it a number of times. The hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex are critical brain regions within the medial temporal lobe, and it's where we see some of the, the cognitive deficits seem to depend uh, or reflect the damages that goes on in the medial temporal lobe. It's one of the earliest loci for the pathological changes in AD, the changes that we can see in uh, fMRI. Um, it's a major site of neuroplasticity for new learning that's sensitive to the effects of various interventions. And subregions show a selective topography of pathological involvement. And particularly, there's a nonlinear decline trajectory. The hippocampal shrinkage is restricted to older adults and entorhinal cortex to the oldest of them. And unlike the neocortical structures, which show a monotonic age-related decline. And by this nonlinear decline trajectory, what we mean is that um, some structures are just slowly bit by bit declining the same sort of each year. But the hippocampal shrink shrinkage and the entorhinal cortex damage is occurring very rapidly at a certain point. And it suggests that that nonlinear decline may suggest the beginning. That's a rapid decline is probably the better way to think of it, suggests the beginning of um, the loss of uh, uh, cellular function in Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm going to just uh, insert here a little pedagogical key. You're going to notice that some of the slides here that follow have a blue background. These slides reflect research from our lab at Rutgers University, Newark. The slides that you see that have a white background reflect material in our textbook or other general sources. So some work from our lab in non-demented or preclinical AD um, we know that mild hippocampal atrophy in non-demented elderly can predict future cognitive decline in AD. So those as seen on the right, uh, similar to a, a graph you saw earlier, you see hippocampal atrophy shrinkage, and therefore more of the ventricles are showing. These people may have no cognitive deficits at that point, but they're the most likely to show cognitive decline in Alzheimer's at a later date. Um, this shows a, uh, a standard neuropsych test of memory, uh, delayed paragraph recall, read a paragraph, five minutes, 10 minutes later, ask about some of the facts in the paragraph. This is episodic memory storage. It's one of the earliest indicators of Alzheimer's. And you see these people with hippocampal atrophy show totally normal uh, uh, delayed paragraph recall. So no cognitive deficits in these standard tests despite this hippocampal atrophy. So as noted, this creates a conundrum for diagnosis. People most likely to get Alzheimer's in a few years are already showing hippocampal and medial temporal lobe atrophy and other changes. But these changes do not yet interfere with learning new episodic memory. One way of uh, trying to understand what's going on is from some computational models that we developed at Rutgers Newark in the 90s, uh, Catherine Myers and I, which argued that the, the input areas of the medial temporal lobe, the entorhinal cortex and the dentate gyrus, which is uh, part of the hippocampus, but sort of the entryway, that these are involved in encoding representations and either compressing out irrelevant information, as in the entorhinal cortex, or in dissociating and spreading out the representations of information that need to be predicting and associated with different outcomes. And we argue that these kinds of representational and encoding uh, remappings, in a sense, take place at these early stages, but that the traditional cognitive tasks associated with the hippocampus, like episodic memory storage, the encoding phase that we talked about, depend on the other later stages of the hippocampus, the CA1, the CA3, and the subiculum. And the reason this dissociation at the level of subfields of the hippocampus, subfields of the, of the medial temporal lobe, because we're including the entorhinal cortex, is important is because 
this is how the time course of Alzheimer's affects these regions differently. And in fact, as noted, the earliest era, the earliest damage that you see in Alzheimer's disease will tend to be in the entorhinal cortex. And so over the course of Alzheimer's disease, only later on do you see the episodic memory deficits, and only later on do you see the damage in the CA3 and the CA1. So this suggests the prediction that we made that the pre-symptomatic or preclinical phase of AD may only affect representation and encoding of learning, but not the episodic memory storage that depends on these other brain regions not affected by early Alzheimer's. And the problem with that is that current neuropsych measures of AD impairments, the standard neuropsych measures that are used in most clinical settings, are all basically testing epi delayed epi episodic memory storage and then delayed recall, like the delayed paragraph graph I showed earlier. For this reason, we suggested that a really important thing to be looking at to try to measure these kinds of encoding changes that may take place in the entorhinal cortex and the dentate gyrus that are affected early in Alzheimer's is to look at generalization. So what is generalization? Imagine you have here um, someone, uh, I think this is Aristotle, who learns that broccoli makes him sick, okay? So he's learned broccoli makes me sick, I avoid broccoli. Now, the question then is what happens the first time that he sees cauliflower? Does he eat it or does he avoid it? How similar is cauliflower to broccoli? So this is the challenge of generalization, the transfer of past learning to new situations. We've argued that damage to the hippocampus and other structures in the medial temporal lobe, especially the entorhinal cortex, impairs the generalization of learning, such that if you damage these brain regions, what will happen is, even if the damage is subtle enough not to affect episodic memory storage, um, it will impair generalization. So you could still learn, we argued, but you won't be able to generalize that. Um, and this was our, our cortico-hippocampal model of associative learning. And for those who are interested, in, in addition to some of the uh, uh, original papers, we have a, a book on it called Gateway to Memory, an Introduction to Neural Network Modeling in Hippocampus and Learning. So let me describe one of the ways in which we developed to test this kind of generalization. And it's a task we call concurrent discrimination and transfer. And it works the following way. Someone, a participant, is shown two stimuli here, a red octagon and a yellow octagon, and asked to guess where is the hidden smiley face. Initially, they may just guess. Let's say they guess left, and they get it correct. Okay. Um, and then later on, we have a transfer generalization task where they see something they've never seen before. In this case, they've, they see a yellow cross and a red cross. Um, and if they uh, ask, well, I've never seen this before, so they randomly guess, they'd, they'd get a 50%. But if they had learned in the past that red predicts, um, red predicts the, the hidden smiley face, then they could transfer their learning to this new phase and get it correct. So it's a concurrent discrimination and transfer. The rules stay the same from phase one to phase two. In this example, the rule red beats yellow stayed the same, but the irrelevant features changed. The shape had changed from being octagon to cross, but that wasn't relevant to the, to the simple rule, the parsimonious rule that we're trying to see if people extract. Now, of course, there wasn't just one pair, um, and it wasn't just shape or just color. In fact, we had eight pairs that they had to learn, four shape rule pairs and four color rule pairs, and then there was generalization in the phase two on each of these. So what we saw here uh, when we did this was these are people who are cognitively normal, but some, have, some do and some don't have hippocampal atrophy, shown in pink. The people with hippocampal atrophy are cognitively normal by standard measures, but we know that they are likely to get mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's in the future. And what we see here is that on phase one, the people with hippocampal atrophy learn just fine, but the people with hippocampal atrophy show many more errors on the phase two. So the idea is that healthy normal people in green um, um, show learn phase one normally, like, like everyone else, but they show relatively few errors in phase two because they've generalized their learning from phase one to phase two. The people with the hippocampal atrophy seem to learn normally on the phase one, but when it comes to phase two, they don't have the benefit. They're not able to apply their learning from phase one so as to do better on phase two. And these are the people from which that other graph was taken. Um, as we can see, they're doing completely normally on uh, the, hip, the delayed paragraph recall. So the bottom line here is that for people with mild damage in the hippocampal region, uh, 
uh, their, cog- their, their episodic memory storage and retrieval is intact, but their ability to generalize is impaired, suggesting that they may have impairments in how they encoded the information, uh, 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 processes which we argue depend on the entorhinal cortex and the dentate gyrus. Now, we followed these people. Uh, there were 53 of them. Uh, they were all non-demented at initial testing, and then they were given a follow-up diagnosis two years later, And what we found was the people who had MCI or Alzheimer's disease, uh, these are the people who two years earlier showed the most generalization errors. But the people who showed very few generalization errors, um, those are the ones who still were normal two years later. So it suggested some degree of these uh, generalization tasks predicting who was or wasn't likely to develop uh, uh, and decline to MCI or Alzheimer's. Now, another question is, what, ha- what does this task identify the prodromal cognitive deficits in people with strong genetic risk for familial ALD, AD? Now, in the past, the study I showed a minute ago, we just followed people who are um, likely to get uh, late-onset Alzheimer's for two years. Uh, but we know that the, the, the progression of the pathology may take 10 or 15 years. Rather than following people to do that, we can look at these people who have this familial Alzheimer's disease. If they have the risk gene, there's a 100% chance that they're going to get Alzheimer's. Um, And so if you test them in their 30s or 40s, you know that these people will get Alzheimer's in their 50s or 60s. And so rather than following people for all these years, you can use these people with this genetic form of Alzheimer's to know who will or won't get it and who is 10 or 15 years away from getting Alzheimer's. So as noted before, these are rare. There are three well-characterized genes that have been identified that have 100% predict the development of Alzheimer's. Uh, they're called presenilin-1, presenilin-2, and amyloid precursor protein. And this familial Alzheimer's represents only about 2 to 5% of the cases, but it provides a unique opportunity to study the earliest phases of Alzheimer's. So you don't have to wait 15 or 20 years to see who will, will or won't get AD. So in these people, we did these healthy, normal people. They were in their, in their uh, mostly in their 30s or 40s. Um, half of them had the uh, familial Alzheimer's mutation, and half were siblings. They were kin non-carriers. So the siblings who did not inherit this gene um, are a particularly useful comparison group. And what we see here is the same pattern we saw before, that in the phase one learning, having a mutation or not having the mutation doesn't affect uh, your learning. But those who had the mutation show a tremendous deficit in the new pairs in the generalization. So as predicted, those people who are probably 10 or 15 years away from getting Alzheimer's are already showing deficits in generalization, even though they're normal at learning, and we know they're normal at episodic memory encoding and retrieval. Moreover, we found that uh, there was a link between the uh, performance, the generalization error, and their left hippocampal volume, so that a bigger left hippocampus meant good generalization or fewer errors, suggesting that even 10 or 15 years before the development of Alzheimer's or development of any sort of dementia, we're seeing uh, the beginning of shrinkage in the hippocampus associated with the generalization impairment. So to summarize this familial study, in healthy pre-asymptotic carriers of familial early onset AD, cognitive deficits in generalization may appear 15 years before the onset of the Alzheimer's diagnosis, 10 years before the onset of mild cognitive impairment, and yet already we're seeing generalization deficits that are related to the loss of left hippocampal volume. Let's talk now about the entorhinal cortex, which we've suggested is one of the earliest stages where pathology can be seen in, in, in structural imaging. Um, it's, uh, the, as I noted, the earliest stage of uh, cellular loss in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you see on the, in, the, in the images on the right, the entorhinal cortex in a healthy uh, human brain, and on the right, you see massive loss in the entorhinal cortex in a patient who died with Alzheimer's. Uh, there are also tau, uh, a tau, the fibrillary tangles um, in this region, and it's evident in the entorhinal cortex, especially very early in the course of the disease. One can also look at the entorhinal cortex thickness in both uh, amnestic mild cognitive impairment, that is people with uh, uh, a memory loss, an amnestic type memory loss um, that is likely sort of probable early Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we see that uh, if we look at just healthy aging, people who are fine, the entorhinal cortex shows essentially no change, no significant change in thickness. Um, 
But if we look at the changes in amnestic mild cognitive impairment, this sort of putative early Alzheimer's or likely early Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's, we see big differences in the, uh, uh, in the thickness of the entorhinal cortex. The entorhinal cortex is not a single homogeneous structure. Rather, it's composed of a lateral and a medial entorhinal cortex. And there are different functions that have been ascribed to each of these regions. And the tangle pathology has, may initiate, especially in the lateral, the outside entorhinal cortex, and spread from there to other sites. So let's look at this more closely. If you see on the right, I mentioned there's a different uh, functionality um, that the, uh, the medial entorhinal cortex, shown on the left and the right, is the wear pathway. It receives input primarily from the parahippocampal cortex. Um, on the right, in that little blue square, which is the entorhinal cortex, is the lateral entorhinal cortex. It receives what information primarily um, from the perirhinal cortex? So as I suggested before, the perirhinal cortex to lateral entorhinal cortex pathway is what's primarily involved in the content or object, um, the what processing, while the perirhinal cortex, uh, I'm sorry, the parahippocampal cortex to medial entorhinal cortex pathway is largely involved in context, context or spatial or global wear processing. So this suggests there's a selective vulnerability in the earliest stage of Alzheimer's in the what pathway. Um, and the lateral entorhinal cortex and the perirhinal cortex indeed show some of the earliest signs of age-related and Alzheimer's-related pathology. So is perirhinal cortex, lateral entorhinal cortex dysfunction a predictor of disease state, or is it just what happens to us as we get older? Well, a number of studies suggest that the lateral entorhinal cortex may be, in effect, the ground zero for the uh, structural uh, pathology and other functional changes that occur. Um, this shows here that cerebral blood volume um, is uh, uh, being reduced in uh, a preclinal Alzheimer's disease group, and it's specific to the lateral entorhinal cortex. And moreover, scare, scores on delayed recall memory, which are sensitive to entorhinal cortex, were particularly correlated with lateral entorhinal cortex rather than medial entorhinal cortex. So additional data suggesting that the lateral entorhinal cortex is really critical to early Alzheimer's. Well, what are the functional consequences of a loss of lateral entorhinal cortex? Well, we said that the, this pathway is particularly involved in object recognition. So one way to test it is to look for how sensitive people are to what an object is um, versus possible distractors. So memory for unique episodic events declines as, as a function of advancing age, even in individuals free from other pathology. And this is thought to rely on the medial temporal lobe. And one way to think of this is in terms of pattern separation or mnemonic discrimination. That is the ability to differentiate our representations of two events, two different objects, um, into distinct non-overlapping representations so we can uh, detect them. Uh, one way to study this work developed by Mike Yassa and colleagues at UC Irvine um, is a task where they show a number of objects, um, and some of these objects are going to be new. You've never seen them before. Some will be old. You will have seen them before. And some will be similar to old objects, but in fact new. And the question is, can you detect whether something is similar to old, or will you confuse it and think that it's uh, uh, actually the old object that you saw before? So we see here in young adults in the lower left corner, um, and the really interesting question is the lores, the similar lores. How well do you recognize them as being a similar lore, and how often do you confuse them with being old? Well, you see in the young adults shown there in that, in that green rectangle that the lores, those that are similar, are most often correctly di uh, recognized as being similar to something old that you saw before, but not exactly the same. In contrast, if you look at older adults, if you look at the lores shown there in, in the sort of the pink rectangle, you see that there the older adults are, are consistently and, and most commonly confusing these similar lores with things that they think is an old object they've seen before. So the bottom line is older adults mistake the novel lores for old previous stimuli. And, uh, and Yasa and colleagues have shown that uh, this uh, uh, discrimination is associated with hyperactivity in the dentate gyrus and the CA3. So you see better discrimination with lower levels of MRI signaling, suggesting that perhaps um, in, uh, in both rats and humans that these impairments um, are associated with too much activity going on, as if these brain regions are trying to uh, um, uh, activate, uh, uh, overcompensate for this functional loss.
Uh, here's a, I'm going to turn now to a paper that we did in collaboration in our lab, in collaboration with Mike Yasa's lab at UC Irvine, um, where we looked at APOE4 status, which we mentioned is a one of the most uh, uh, strongest risk factors in older African Americans, and showed that that's associated with deficits in pattern separation, the task we just described, and hippocampal hyperactivation. So again, this is the task that described before. Objects are shown. You have to describe whether something is novel, whether that is it's new, whether it's a repeat, or whether it's a similar lore. And we found two things. We found that those in the APOE4 risk group, those with the highest risk of Alzheimer's, are more likely to false alarm to similar items, to see, think that something uh, that's similar is new, and that they have an impaired discrimination, a measure of the separation, impaired an ability to tell apart the uh, the similar from the the lores from the the old uh, repeated tasks, and that's what's shown before. If we compute this lore discrimination index, we see that those who have the uh, the APOE four plus are doing the worst at discrimination. And moreover, if we look across basically all of the hippocampal subfields, the CA one, uh, the dentate gyrus CA three, uh, what we see is that there's a hyperactivation in these fields in those who have the APOE4 risk, suggesting again that uh, this APOE4, people who have the highest likelihood of developing Alzheimer's, um, are, uh, are in some sense the brain is overcompensating by being too active. Um, and again, this hyperactivation, the more hyperactivation there was, the worse you saw behaviorally in the pattern separation ability. So let me summarize here what we know about the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe in Alzheimer's disease. The medial temporal lobe, especially the entorhinal cortex, is the earliest sites of pathology and source of early cognitive deficits. Um, two, early damage to the entorhinal cortex and the dentate gyrus may primarily impact stimulus encoding and representation, but not episodic memory storage, as seen in measures of the generalization of associative learning. The lateral entorhinal cortex, which is key for what pathway, identifying what something is, um, shows the earliest deficits structurally, and that results behaviorally in impairing mnemonic discrimination, our ability to discriminate two memories, um, to do pattern separation of memories for objects. And finally, uh, as shown in this collaborative study we did with the ASA lab, APOE high-risk individuals show impairment at object pattern separation associated with fMRI hyperactivation in hippocampal subfields, which is related to impairments in pattern separation, linking together Alzheimer's risk, hyperactivation in the subfields, and the behavioral measures of object pattern separation. So let's talk to the end about, well, what can we do about this? Well, one of the most important uh, risk factors for Alzheimer's is a lack of aerobic fitness, a lack of exercise. And we'll describe now some of the data from our lab, again, in older African Americans, looking at uh, aerobic fitness, which is sort of how fit somebody is, their, their sort of aerobic capacity, and the effects of exercise on their brain um, function and the medial temporal lobe. So this is a study on ABCA7 risk genotype, diminishing the neuroprotective value of fitness in healthy older African Americans. So African Americans have about twice the risk for Alzheimer's disease. They're more likely to have severe symptoms, and we don't yet know why African Americans are at higher risk. Um, some of it is certainly due to lifestyle uh, and other environmental factors, but there are also genetic components that may be playing a role. The ABCA7 gene, which I mentioned earlier, is a risk factor. Those who have it are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, and ABCA7 affects the transport of proteins in the brain, including the amyloid precursor protein, which is associated with amyloid accumulation. How do we measure physical fitness? Well, what we do is we ask people simply, how far can participants walk in six minutes? And this is a, an approximate for someone's maximal oxygen consumption that they can do, what's often called VO2 max. Now, we did this on uh, many hundreds of people who've come through our study, and the first thing to note is that variations in this fit measure of physical fitness, you know, how far you can walk in six minutes, does not correlate with any of the standard neuropsychological measures of cognition. These are the measures that a, a neuropsychologist or an MD would do if you brought them into a memory clinic. It doesn't affect delayed recall, which is a test of, of uh, uh, episodic memory that we've discussed in the past. MMSC is a, uh, a, is a general test of, of cognition. 
Digit span is a test of working memory. We know that declines with age as well, as we discussed earlier, dependent on the frontal lobes. We see here that physical fitness in our population didn't correlate with any of these. But it did correlate with these measures of generalization, suggesting that whatever it is that physical fitness is doing to protect the brain, it seems to be very sensitive to the cognitive changes that happen in generalization. So suggesting, again, that generalization differences may be particularly good measure of the risk factors uh, and individual differences of risk for Alzheimer's disease. But what's important is that although we see a fit here but across everybody, um, the effect wasn't seen in everyone. Um, and in particular, if we look at this ABCA7 gene, we see that the ABCA7 gene modulates the fitness to generalization relationship. So if we sorted people in terms of those with the risk genotype and those with the non-risk genotype, what we see is quite striking. Those with the risk genotype show no significant correlation between physical fitness and their generalization ability. Those with the non-risk genotype now show an incredibly strong and significant effect because we've essentially removed all the non-risk genotype people who did not show a relationship. So what does this suggest? This suggests that ABCA7 may modulate the ability of exercise to improve memory. So we showed here that people, that when we compare aerobic fitness across different people at one point in time, that's the data which I just showed, only those with the ABCA7 non-risk variant had significantly better generalization ability if they were of high fitness. This suggests that within an individual, if we start with someone with low fitness and we change their fitness level through exercise, that ABCA7 status will modulate the degree to which individuals will show cognitive improvement. So our method here was to, uh, we did a whole bunch of cognitive assessments, physical fitness, and so forth. We had participants, 55 to 90, all older African Americans. They enrolled in a five-month dance-based aerobic exercise program, similar to Zumba. Um, they came twice a week for 60 minutes and was held in the community at churches and at senior centers and at housing sites. And then we reassessed them cognitively and otherwise after the intervention. <laughs> And as predicted, after this 20-week aerobic exercise intervention, only the carriers of the low-risk ABCA7 genotype showed exercise-related cognitive improvements that said that even though these people with the high-risk genotype may have gotten more fit, they may have benefited cardiovascularly from the exercise, what we see is that those in the uh, only those in the low-risk gene showed an improvement, showed a reduction in generalization areas. So if you look at the control people, those people who didn't do the exercise, um, whether they had the gene or not, um, it didn't affect the generalization errors before or after. Um, in those in the exercise group, um, those in the high-risk group, post-exercise, they showed no change. Those in, in the low-risk uh, genotype showed the significant change, and that's good. Um, so it showed, suggests, therefore, that to summarize the conclusions, carriers of the non-risk ABCA7 variant showed a strong correlation between physical fitness and generalization across subjects, but no, and no significant association between fitness and generalization. So it suggests that this ABCA7 risk genotype may diminish the neuroprotective effects of fitness and reduce the effects of exercise in protecting the brain in African Americans, again, because this is a gene that's specifically found in those of African ancestry. So let me summarize here. While aerobic physical fitness can help protect against Alzheimer's, African Americans with a high-risk variant of the ABCA7 gene show less benefit from higher levels of fitness. But these effects are only apparent with, with tests of generalization, which we have shown is sensitive to the enterhinal hippocampal pathways, but not with standard measures of recall working memory, or overall cognitive status. So this brings us to the end of the, the main part of the, of the talk. Let me summarize here. What were some of the objectives of this lecture? What is it that you're responsible for on the exam? So the learning objectives here were to describe the progression of normal aging and to be able to link neuroanatomical changes to cognitive changes. You should be able to identify the brain areas and cellular systems that are most vulnerable to early Alzheimer's disease.
identify the behavioral symptoms of both early and late Alzheimer's disease, know the different characteristics of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, describe what is known about APOE, ABCA7, and familial early onset genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's, Understand why the hippocampus and medial temporal lobe are key to early Alzheimer's and what's particularly important about the lateral entorhinal cortex. Describe the behavioral paradigms of generalization and object pattern separation and how and why they are sensitive to early medial temporal lobe changes in Alzheimer's disease. And ask how does fitness affect cognition and Alzheimer's disease risk and how it's mediated by the genetic risk factors specific to African Americans. So those are the learning objectives for this lecture and for the exam. But there's another learning objective, which is to ask to know how you can make changes in your own lifestyle to reduce your risk for age-related cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. So let me end here with just some general use. Um, uh, general information that might be useful to you to know what are the six steps that you can take to have a better memory and reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease. So here goes. The first is exercise regularly. Keep mentally active. Manage stress, because stress is toxic to the brain cells. Get a good night's sleep. Sleep is critical for uh, removing toxins from the brain and uh, resetting the brain's memory systems. Socialize with others. Social interaction is, is critical to keeping our brains active, and people in isolation late in life tend to show the highest risk. And eat a healthy diet. Um, you don't want to be eating a lot of, uh, of, of fats. You want to eat a lot of vegetables and, and fish, um, and uh, particularly reduce sugar. Sugar is particularly toxic to the brain. So these are the six steps that uh, um, are the best things that you can do to learn about how to keep your brain healthy. Thank you very much. Uh, this talk was prepared in uh, collaboration with my faculty research associate, Neha Sinha. If you have any information, if you want any uh, questions, you can contact me at the email address or look at our two web pages, the lab web page, www.gluck.edu, um, and our community brain health page, www.brainhealth.rutgers.edu. Thank you very much.